In some sense, this is really what we were trying to avoid, <laughs> is all these machines. Each one of these has kind of a special purpose, right? And so to make a part, I might have to start over here and, you know, and cut the raw material over there. Then I might have to drill holes in it over there, right? And there's a CNC back over there. So you can see how, why it would take so long to make something, right? Each one of these has, does a different operation. And so what we have in an SLS machine is all operations in one machine, really, because there's essentially only one operation that's adding stuff. And so it kind of gives you a feel for, we compressed all this into one little machine. Really. This ungainly machine doesn't look like much, but at the touch of a button, it can make 3D objects from a simple computer drawing. It's the latest in desktop manufacturing. The process is known as selective laser centering. SLS kind of started with a graduate student who came into my office and said, how do you make something quicker? And this was back in 1986, and so it takes you about, you try to make something the first time, make the first one of something, takes you six months. So why does it have to be all that slow? Essentially what we wanted to do was go right from a computer to the object by hitting hard copy. And that's really what we were shooting for. Selective laser centering is essentially a way of making very complex objects very fast. And both of those are important statements. The very fast is what we were focusing on, but I think maybe at the end of the day, the complexity may be even more important because now I can make these things I never could have made before, at least not economically. This is the first part we built. And it's supposed to be a box in a box, which meant this is supposed to be straight lines rather than curved. And so you can imagine me trying to go to a venture capitalist and say, you know, you need to invest in this. We were lucky in a lot of ways, actually. 1986 was an oil bust, and Texas decided they were no longer going to depend solely on oil and gas. They're going to become a technology state. So there was funds available for doing technology. And of course, lasers were considered high tech. So essentially what I did is I wrote a proposal that we were going to cut sheet metal with a laser, which we never did. But I had to have that laser to do what we wanted to do. I didn't think they would actually go for us fusing together powders to make three-dimensional objects. I don't think they'd have believed us. And when did the invention of SLS really happen? It's really a process. You know, you have the concept phase, but then you have all these improvements, and all of these are little, little bitty inventions, and they all have to kind of work. I tell my students that engineering is really easy, just there's so much of it, right? Because you have to solve each one of these problems, and if they all don't work, nothing works typically. So they all have to work together in a system. What you were taught before as a mechanical engineer is you do not want to have a whole lot of complexity in your design because you have to machine it. And so if I can now make you know, shape like that, just as easy as I can make a cube, what can you do? So anything that contacts a person, like a prosthetic, uh, you would really like to sculpture the prosthetic so it has a perfect fit. But that thing would be hard to make any other way. We thought we were going to have everything, we were going to be building automobiles like in five years, but obviously we're wrong, it's way out there still. Uh, but even what it does today, is pretty revolutionary and uh, the fact that I can go from that art on the screen to the part and I can have it that day is pretty unique and uh, it enables all kinds of different businesses and business models all the way from prototypes which is what we started with but now people want to manufacture and so it's almost a question if you can imagine it we can build it.